And thanks everybody for joining us here today. Uh, we know that there's always lots of uh, options vying for your time. So we appreciate everybody taking some time to join us uh, for this conversation today. So last week, if you were with us, at John Kemp on, and we really laid a good groundwork, I think, for why it's important to have good quality seed, some of the characteristics of what that good quality seed looks like, and then what things can we be doing as we grow that seed to really ensure that it's the highest quality possible. So if you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and watch that webinar because that's going to kind of set the groundwork. Jeff and I will be referring back to that. Uh, here some as well. So if you haven't watched that, that'll be a great one to go back and watch. But uh, this afternoon, we have uh, Jeff Steffen. Uh, Jeff is from Crofton, Nebraska, the northeast part of the state. Uh, guys, Jeff, I don't know how long you've been growing seed for us, but I think you were one of the very first guys that started growing oats uh, for us. Uh, I don't know, probably more than 10 years ago, 10, 12, 13 years ago. I don't even remember when. You probably have a better memory than me. But Jeff is a great seed grower. Uh, he's been growing certified seed oats for many, many years up there in the northeast part of the state. Uh, really good oats growing country. But Jeff grows lots more things than just oats, and he'll talk about that a little bit as well. And, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to feature some of our seed growers and not just talk about what they're doing to grow good quality seed for green cover and for, for customers, but to, to just kind of open up and share about their whole operation because what makes a good seed grower is a good management system. And it's not just about growing the seed. It's what happened the year before and the year before that and what's going to happen the next year to make that system truly resilient and regenerative. And Jeff does a great job of that. He'll he'll share uh, some of his story uh, in the different regenerative practices that uh, he and his wife, Jolene, are using up there in Crofton, Nebraska. So, Jeff, I'm excited for the conversation. Uh, Jeff's got some slides, some pictures that he's going to share as he tells the story. So I'm going to go off screen while he's doing that. And then when he's done, I'll come back on. We'll have a discussion and then we'll answer everybody's questions and continue the discussion that way. So, uh, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, I remember being down uh, by your place when there was just a few old bins there. So I don't know how many years ago that would be. But uh, I will sure, share my I'm sure screen. It's been there. ten or twelve at least. Yeah, <laughs> back when we were young. Okay, can we all see this? Yep, yep, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Keith. Um, yeah, I'm Jeff Steffen. Uh, this is a picture of of our headquarters, I guess. Um, and like Keith said, we've we've been working at farming regeneratively for quite a few years now. Um, and a big part of our rotation is having a a cool season crop in the rotation. It's probably a third of our rotation now. Um, here's a picture of my wife Jolene with with uh, me. We're in a. This is a field of. Um, Milling rye, Danko milling rye. Actually, Jolene mills our grain that we consume or whatever. So uh, we're usually, we grow quite a, quite a few different species of small grains, um, but you know, oats is our favorite. Uh, we do have two grown children that have went on to professional lives, you know, still really in the heart, but we also have extended family and neighbors that we collaborate with um, that really help us out. Uh, but just to give you an example of, of the system, you know, our seed is growing in, um, this is, this is just kind of an example of what our, the rotation looks like. Uh, you know, obviously we do have corn and beans, but even in the corn and bean years, we're trying to incorporate, uh, cover and, and, uh, down there in the bottom there, that is, uh, interceding into corn. You know, we experiment with that. Um, we drill our soybeans into cover crop and most you know recently pretty much uh it's all drilled into green um, we do seven and a half inch rows kind of for weed control and then on the top there is uh an example of of an oats field and um we're convinced the health of it is a result of what we have in our rotation 
And then as a result, having that cool season crop, we can go to farm season annuals after oats and graze them. And um, we've been able to show that, that that's actually, you can have a quite productive farm farming that way. So we grow for seed. Um, this is just some of the examples actually, but buckwheat, peas, uh, cereal rye, we grow non-GMO soybeans. Um, we have a license out of Iowa State um, that we grow them for seed. Heritage corns we mess with, uh, mainly we use them for grazing. Uh, but my folks, and, and that is probably um, the bulk of our, what should I call our special acres other than corn and beans. Um, historically, it's been a good region for oats. Um, we have just enough coolness in late summer um, um, to keep the test weights up and so forth. But uh, at one point or another, um, all of these types of seeds have gone to green cover. And uh, it's been a great relationship um, back and forth um, learning about the seed industry and, uh, and, and, you know, trying to get the quality that they want. So I do my own conditioning. Um, I'm in the Crop Improvement Association. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty humble affair, but um, we run a lot of bushels through this. Uh, we have a crip and cleaner. And uh, uh, as far as crop improvement is concerned, I'm, a, I'm my own conditioner. So I can send samples right off my farm um, to be certified. So the process for certifying seed, um, for one thing, I, I had to join Nebraska Crop Improvement Association. And this is for your PVP seeds, you know, that are protected. So like the oats, the fresh morose that we're now growing, that has to be um, gone through this process before we can sell it. Um, like I said, we joined the Nebraska Crop Improvement Association. Uh, we obtain foundation seed from them and then we apply for field inspection. So our fields are inspected and okayed prior to harvest. So that is also a learning you know, you learn a lot with that back and forth as far as your disease and your weed pressures. Uh, There's certain things you can have, uh, you know, to have it certified. Um, and then after harvest, if the field is okay, the seed is conditioned and a sample set to Nebraska crop for final certification. Even the non-patented seeds that we raise, um, they still need to go sample sent to a lab uh, for, you know, for analysis legally to sell it. So what, what I'll go into here is just, just a little bit of example of, of the rotation and uh, the principles we use in our production. Now oats, uh, historically in Cedar County, I was looking up the data this last week, in the 70s, our our oats yields were 93% of our corn yields, which is very interesting. Um, and then through the years, people started saying we can't grow good oats anymore. And it, to me, it's like, you know, we, we weren't paying attention to, you know, details on raising our oats. And also, oats likes really good high organic matter ground. Uh, it doesn't, it seems like you can't replace it just with fertility um, to grow it. So here's some oats. We spend a lot of time setting the drill. Uh, I like to, you know, we've been no-till for probably 35 years. Uh, I like to make sure the oats is always set below all residue into firm soils. Because what I'm shooting for is even emergence, uh, basically like you would, you would want with your corn crop. Um, no fertility is put on this field at this point. We're, you know, we're trying, our concentration now is to make the soil food web work. Um, so basically this field has a, you know, a, a stacked extended rotation. So at this point, there hasn't been oats in this field for quite a few years. Uh, no fertility is put on this field except for compost extract. And I forgot to mention, Jolene has just 
finish the Alignum course. So it, it's something new that we've been getting into is uh, applying biologicals to our seed. So at this point, so it's the only fertility it's had compost extract and seed. And at this point, we usually will put on um, an ALS herbicide and a, and a low rate of a 240 product MCPA um, to handle annual weeds that crop improvement doesn't want to see in, in the samples. So that would be the only herbicide application on this field uh, for this year. We also are no tilling into irrigated corn stalks where you, you, know, you really have to concentrate on getting your seed depth down underneath the residue. Uh, but we found with good soil structure, you can plant oats quite deep and, uh, and you will get good emergence. Uh, feel the key is, is even emergence. Also, uh, an even population uh, is where you have excess population in oats, you won't have the same tillering. So we're shooting for a million seeds an acre uh, to get um, the proper tillering we want um, for more oat heads. So here's when we finally put some fertility on. This is kind of in the late vegetative stage. Um, we'll stream on um, some UAN, probably some sulfur. Um, I'm looking into, I wanna put add humix to this fertilizer. But this is the total fertility put on this oats field. Um, I think it was 40, this year was 47 units. This is a picture from a few years ago, but uh, we just stream it on in 10 inch, 10 inch bands. So this is a picture of oats. This is about the time that crop improvement inspects it. Uh, you can see we have really good health here. We use no insecticide. On just uh, no desiccants on our oats. So what's amazing is the last several years how we've seen problems with insects and diseases slowly disappear. Because what we're showing here is these are ripe conditions for disease when you have these humid mornings where the oats is wet until, until noon. Uh, not sure if it's a combination of the long-term practices we've been doing, but also the breeding. Um, this is oats from South Dakota State. You know, they're constantly breeding for more resistance. So this brings us to the harvest time. Uh, generally, uh, we've been harvesting our oats um, intact, you know, uh, without swathing it. Generally, we like to carry the head as high as we can to clip the heads off. What this picture shows, this oats was, was really heavy, and we had a hard, heavy rain on it, and uh, we had quite a bit of lodging, um, so we're having to go down low on it. So you need to spend a lot of time with the combine getting the residue spread. Our goal is to leave almost all our straw on the field. We're, we're really concentrating on trying to get more carbon in the system. Um, this is really good oats right here. The yield monitor was running a little over 170 <clears throat> in this particular part of the field. Once we harvest seed, it needs to directly go on air uh, when you harvest direct like this. Because um, even, even dry oats will go through a sweat. So we put it on drying floors with, with uh, large capacity drying fans. Um, monitor the oats through the summer and in the fall I make sure I always cool it down uh, actually get it pretty cold it's that's cold and dry is good for insect resistance in the seed this is more what I like to see for after harvest oats you can see this oats was standing well because uh, immediately after harvest our goal is to have a cover crop drilled into it What's amazing, even this was a pretty dry part of the year right here, is the oats had had um, died on its own. Um, and with all this cover, there was still moisture under that, that stubble. So we got our seeds to emerge. So then, late in the summer, this is what really supercharges our system. Uh, 
and like this is an example of a mix that I would put in uh, if it's going to corn the next year. Usually when I figure out my mixes, I go to Green Cover's Smart Mix Calculator um, to figure out the amounts. And I think that that has really been beneficial um, that way. And I can't raise all these seeds. My interest, after listening to John Kemp and uh, Dr. James White, is my interest now is to get as much diversity in the system as possible at this point. Uh, when you hear Dr. James White talk about the diversity of of exodus, we want to get in the soil to get to get the biology uh, for nutrient cycling and and for resistance of diseases. And also in the system, I mean, this is your chance to get the regenerative cycle going. And like he talks about the fifty two days. <laughs> uh this is probably 52 days and and uh when you can get this kind of growth and with this much diversity um what's going on here i'll have this will have a tail for several years for what it does to the soil now that the cover crop this cover crop was well this is more for what i would a mix i would plant before corn uh, this is more an example of if it's going to beans the next year uh, I would prefer to have some more sorghums in that. We we're going to be working on that. But uh, basically, as a result of looking at the Smart Mix calculator, we're coming up with mixes and, sh and we put in if it's going to corn or soybeans. So after growing all that forage, you know, we do generally harvest probably half of it. And uh, we have... We have family with a lot of cows. Uh, it's never a problem in, in getting numbers that way. So we'll generally have cows all winter uh, on various fields. And generally they need next to zero hay, close to almost no hay. Um, you can see there with the snowfall or the snow on this cover crop here, still really good forage qualities. Uh, this past winter, the only hay we fed was, was during uh, blizzard, blizzard events. And I have, I've been keeping more detailed numbers on the on the fall and winter grazing. I probably don't have time to talk about it as much right now. We're, you know, we're concentrating on the seed part. But as far as having rotation, um, you know, this is several years ago. Uh, and normally I'm planting green now, but after having cows on this over the winter time, uh, it's just amazing how you can, um, help with your weed control. There's no burn down been applied to this field yet. It's May 5th. Um, and look at the, the weed control we have. And this is going to non-GMO soybeans, um, which we get, a, you know, we get a premium on even selling the commodity. So it's, it's just a part now for getting weed control. So here's late June in that field. Uh, we drill in seven and a half inch rows. A lot of times people go away from that because of disease problems. We've been finding with our extended rotation, even in these types of situations, when you have weather that, that causes disease, we're having very little. Uh, we have not applied any insecticide or fungicide since 2011. And we have never applied fungicide on oats. Um, also have corn in our rotation. We plant mostly non-GMO corn. Uh, and we, this past year, we probably plant half of our corn is probably non-treated seed. And um, we had some interesting, you know, studies with it. This field here is an example of a corn field planted in the soybean stubble. Uh, UNL has a, a Monitor out there for, for moisture. We're doing a, it's a cover crop study. Uh, it was replicated a couple times. Are you hearing me now? Yes, we can still hear you, Jeff. Okay, it just said it was unstable here. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, lagging, it's lagging a little bit, but it's it's not too bad. Okay. 
of Toxlor. <laughs> uh, this was an interesting study. Actually, uh, the cover crop uh, corn um, did nine bushels better. Uh, it was mainly probably because of weed control. You know, we're really having trouble um, uh, getting ahead of the resistant weeds. Uh, but also, this is untreated planted into terminated cover crop. Um, it, it was just interesting, even in this conditions, how, you know, we had a really good stand. We did apply compost extract on this corn seed. Uh, it's the first time we've tried it. Uh, we don't have really good data on it yet. Um, but uh, as you can see, the corn looks really well there. We, we don't apply any fertilizer to our corn until it's up. You know, we've been trying to concentrate on what can the biology do for us um, and getting the seed, getting the plant going, uh, getting the soil food web going. So right about this stage, um, I probably streamed on um, right at 50 units of N. So this field on the right here, that produced, it was a dry land field. It was 182 bushels, 50 units of N applied. That was the only fertilizer put on. Um, the field on the left here, that's an example of, that's an irrigated field. Um, this is a strip with some 60 inch rows. It's after cereal, cereal rye, you can see the really good cover. Uh, this is also untreated seed. Uh, all fertility was put on post. I think this had 120 units. Uh, but you can see the good weed control, very little post herbicide, uh, and also really no signs of a nitrogen deficiency. You know, with the talk of with the talk of that residue and that that rye stubble, you know, tying up nitrogen. Um, you know, really good shows really good health. This is just examples of of kind of the system we're in um, that our seed production is coming out of. And then also there's been a lot more interest lately, especially in our operation is actually going to some annual grazing where the only crop for the year is growing cows. Uh, we do, this is on the right, that is Jimmy Red, grazing Jimmy Red corn. Uh, I call it grazing in the shade on a hot day. Um, we've had really good luck with that. Um, but it is, you know, it is more of a later summer grazing period. So our interest is to probably go more to a diverse mix, uh, somewhat like the left picture, even though this picture on the left is after an oats crop. Um, we're, we want to go to uh, where we have some cool seasons to graze in the spring and then a full summer cover crop grazing. Um, without corn, because we'll probably rotate to corn, uh, and then see if we can get some data on, you know, what what does the income look like on that? Because uh, we've been getting a lot of questions on, you know, is this something we can e economically do, you know, with our low commodity prices to go into summer annual grazing? So I'll touch just a little bit. I do quite a bit of work on economics uh, and and. I've been working on this since 2015. I um, work with UNL and their crop budgets and our local agronomists in trying to put hard numbers to you know the gains we're getting with our system. Um, but this is just a, a graph of the of our 2023 farm results on our 500 acre system, and what it's comparing to is if our farm would have just been corn and beans with traditional inputs. So the blue bars is our extended rotation, actually the numbers from this year. And the red bar is using UNL recommendations for inputs, kind of run it through the agronomist and yields um, for having a corn bean system. So, you know, you can see my revenue is generally lower uh, and this is figuring, even though I sell seed, we're figuring the value of the grain before it goes into the seed enterprise. So for an example, for oats price, I used 
like what green cover would pay for oats in the dirt before it's um, gone into the conditioning process or even a milling price is what I used on that. So you can see generally, and, and we've been seeing this for close to 10 years now is we can lower our inputs 150 to $250 an acre with this system. It takes a lot of the pressure off on needing to have the revenue high. Uh, so for this past year, um, you can see the net per acre. We're quite a bit higher than if we were corn and beans. And this was even conceding that we had lower corn yields than the corn bean system. Uh, half of our farm is irrigated. I probably should make that that point. Um, so it, it's 500 acres figure in a corn bean rotation, half of it irrigated and half of it dry land with our soil types. So interesting then, I just threw in some projections for 2024 uh, using 480 for corn. You know, hopefully we can get that at some point. Uh, the price of small grains has come back quite a bit. I think I used $4 on the oats price here. Uh, so irrigated oats was at best, I figured, a break-even deal this year. I have no intention of taking that out of the system. I almost look at that as being a, a regenerative part of the system. So even with those projections of less revenue for the oats, uh, we're doing some annual grazing, um, our cost per acre are still so much lower. You can see we we come up with a prediction of a pretty good net. Anybody that's been running budgets on corn and beans this year know that it doesn't look really good. Um, and this is figuring our local land costs uh, when we compare. So I have a lot more details on that if at some point anybody wants to ask me more questions, but um, for the sake of time, I wanted to concentrate on the seed. Through the years, uh, it's been interesting, the observations I've seen in the way our system has changed. Um, we always have some research plots on the farm. I like to run micro plots of different oats varieties, sometimes more for observation than even the hard data. What we will do like on a plot, like on the oats here, we will go in and hand harvest some replications and uh, and actually use uh, digital scales and get some estimates on dry matter and grain yield. Um, mostly like to do these thing, kind of things for observation. So since we raise non-GMO beans, I usually have a test plot where I'm comparing them with, with the most recent traded beans. Uh, and then also to observe their disease resistance too. After listening to uh, John Kemp last week, it really got me thinking about is, is our seed that we're producing different? And um, happened to realize that we, we had a three years in this one field where they were tracking the increase in soil health. And on year two of it, they took a sample of the oats we produced off of it and did an analysis of it. So I, I went and looked that up this week and I compared it to uh, what feedtables.com considers uh, average composition of their of oats. And, and this sample of oats was before it was cleaned. Uh, so it would be what would be considered normal feed oats. Um, really thought it was interesting on in a system with very low fertility added, uh, we had protein levels higher than what they considered average. Interesting to see that our phosphorus level was 133% of average. They did grid sampling and, and uh, GPS coordinated samples of the soil where this oats came off of. And the phosphorus levels in these soils are extremely low, they're single digit. Uh, and we still have phosphorus in the oats well above average. You know, I really thought that was interesting. Listening to John last week, uh, he talked about boron. That was one thing we didn't have in this sample. Uh, it is interesting though that the molybdenum 
was three times average. So the micro, the micronutrients, you know, that we're looking into. So it all, it all starts making you think, you know, is there, there's really a big difference in the seed quality and the more nutrients we have in the seed, the healthier plant that you all end up getting. Uh, and then also with the, the test weight, um, like the test weight of rose this year was right at 40 pounds. So you have a large, heavy seed, um, 12,000 pound, 12,000 seeds per pound where normal oats is 15,000. Um, so it, it's just an interesting study, you know, can we have, can we make a lot of difference in our seed quality? So what it made me think of is I went and found these pictures back from 2011. Um, when we first started growing a lot more oats for seed, you know, we kind of went through a time period where we went away from oats. And when I was a kid, we always had rust in oats. Um, we would winrow, dad bought two swathers. We would winrow thousands of acres of oats for the neighbors. There was a lot of oats in the country. And it just seemed there was always rust. And even in 2011 um, here, we're swathing a field. And so the answer to that rust problem is just get your nephew Trevor to do it. So uh, um, this is a 40, 40 year old uh, windrower that we're out um, uh, windrowing oats with. But it just, what it did was it really made me start thinking of how all of us without realizing it, um, it's been several years now since our field inspections have showed rust when they, when they inspect it for disease late in the season. The question is, is it from the health of the system or is it also, you know, from some of the breeding that South Dakota State is doing, you know, and getting resistance in there. Another observation is in our seed, this is a field of seed beans. Um, no fertility, is untreated seed, drilled. Uh, we have been having problems with, uh, I should say dicamba, could be 2,4-D. Been getting a lot of drift, a lot of uh, our beans really aren't growing well until we get into August. So we're losing some weed control that way. You know, they, you can see we have weeds there that we can't control with post-emergent herbicide. But this was a very productive field uh, in spite of what we have there. Uh, we had a lot of problems with, in the neighborhood, there was a lot of problems with uh, sudden death this year. We had conditions that were conducive to it. And in these drilled beans, there was, it was really hard to find any signs of it. Even though it's seven and a half inch rows, irrigated beans, so these here with basically zero inputs were right at 70 bushels an acre at this point and only three inches of irrigation water. Um, so just what I've been seeing as far as the benefits of an extended rotation. Also some other observations. Um, these two pictures were taking minutes apart, a mile apart. Uh, had a really heavy rainfall uh, this past summer. And traditionally, this is our field on the right planted to uh, seed oats. Traditionally, this field 30 years ago would have been overwhelmed with water from the upland, like this field on the left a mile away. We have very little runoff from the upland anymore. And also the inequality, the quality of the soil so much on this field um, that you can really see how it shouldered this, this heavy rain event well. This is the same rain event on the slopes. Um, amazing the difference after, you know, after years of a soil health system. And then let's go to the dry, dry years, uh, the differences we're seeing. Um, so just some examples of, of 
the system that we're raising our seed in. If you go to the soil survey map, this is Thurman sand. It's 70% sand, 15% clay. Uh, they rate it like a class four, class six dry land, suggest that you don't dry land farm it. And uh, this is what we've been able to do with it. So. Have for that, uh, I'd like to have some conversation. Well, thanks, Jeff. Boy, I got two pages of notes here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be asking the first questions here. Uh, folks, feel free to put your questions in the the Q and A box there, and we'll get to those as well. Uh, but man, such great information there, Jeff. Thanks thanks for sharing that. First of all, how common is it, you know, in your area, you know, we know Northeast Nebraska, you know, different conditions, environment, but how common is it for other farmers around to have a third of their rotation be in some sort of a cool season, small grain? Is that fairly common or not common at all? No, it's not common. Maybe there's some thoughts of it. I can drive all the way to Lincoln and not see an oats field. Um, uh, there's starting to be more questions about it now. And obviously when commodities go down, people start to ask questions. So. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I expected you to say, because it's not common almost anywhere. And, and the, the, the annual grazing, you know, not common. So you're doing a lot of uncommon things, but you know, your, your, your slides that you had on your economics were just, just stunning. And I mean, we could spend that, that may have to be a whole other webinar sometime because of, you know, your, your profitability numbers, less, less gross income, but so much less expenses, so many less inputs. And, and if I, if I wrote this down, right, 47 units of nitrogen for 170 bushel oats. Well, what would the university recommendation be to grow 170 bushel oats? Well, for one thing, I don't know if they would even say you consider the 170 bushel oats. Um, generally, I think the university will say you you can't you can only put so much nitrogen on oats. I think they usually limit it to 90 uh, when they say it, just because of problems you'll have. Yeah, uh, but because of how your system is getting the nitrogen, you don't typically have those lodging issues associated with. Yep, and, and then. 50 units of nitrogen for 182 bushel corn, which again is is incredible, but it's because you've got the rotation, you've got the small grain, so you can follow it with that nitrogen fixing cover crop. Right, and you always have to explain, okay, this is what happened last year and the year before and the year before that, that led up to this possibility. Um, our total farm uh, production this year of corn was, was 0.35 units applied um per bushel of corn but you know we had a field we where we applied none because it was coming out of alfalfa orchard grass so i mean it's all because of the system yeah yeah and and the livestock integration is is a big help to that as well so uh you know just yeah that was a great overview of not just you know how you're growing quality seed for green cover so that we can pass that on to the customers but also, you know, how you're making the whole system work on a relatively small operation. I mean, you know, and, and this is your full-time job. I want people to know, you know, Jeff's not got an off-farm job. He's making a right. living on, what, five, 600 acres because of the system you're doing. And, yeah. And, and, and so that's me, really that impressive. Is, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's super impressive and very rare. And what I'm hoping is it can give some hope to a younger, younger farmer uh, that if, if if we really concentrate on doing some things different, that there is a chance to make it on on less acres. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to go to a few of the questions that uh, people have put in here. Uh, feel free to, to pop other ones in there. I've got uh, a number of other things, too. But uh, Willie's asking, have you tried growing corn with zero? nitrogen inputs, even if it's just a, a strip to just kind of see, you know, what could your system do with no synthetic nitrogen? That is the plan this year. 
Um, we have not yet. Um, we are going to do an experiment. Now that Jolene has gone through these courses, we are going to do some experiment with just um, compost and, and foliar compost and then uh, do replicated side-by-sides with, with probably what we'd normally put on for nitrogen. Uh, I do, you know, like even when I put, by the time I put fertilizer on the oats, it is starting to show nitrogen deficiency. I mean, there is a yellow there. So I'm, I am getting response from it. Uh, probably same with the corn. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping that even starts to change more um, where I see less and less response from the nitrogen. We're seeing no response from phosphorus. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, apart from your economic slide, I thought the most interesting slide was, you know, the the mineral analysis of your oats versus, you know, kind of the industry average. And to, yeah, to see the levels of those nutrients and, and uh, you know, in a very low fertility environment, it tells you that your system is cranking out those nutrients from the system and not from a jug. A couple questions related to some of that. Uh, Teron is asking, you know, what? Talk a little bit more about your compost extract process. Are you are you making that yourself? Are you making your own compost? Uh, are you purchasing that? Where where is that coming from, and what are you using? Okay, this past year it was almost all from our own thermal pile, um, and we have a mic. You know, as a result of these courses Jolene took, we have our own microscope. Um, so what we're doing is we're analyzing the compost, you know, just to make sure we have things in there that we want. Uh, did a limited amount of foliar this year, but after I had it all loaded in the sprayer, we even checked that to make make sure we still had had uh, had live live animals in it. Um, we did, we do experiment a little bit with Elevate Eggs um, biologicals um, in there also. Uh, but for the most part, it's been our own, our own uh, compost extracts, and and that we've been learning to to make from our own thermal piles. Mm -hmm. And a thermal pile means it heats up. You turn it, it heats up. You turn it. That that type of a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And and how long how long of a process would you say that is? Generally, it'll take <clears throat> a couple weeks. You you know if, if you do everything right in in two to three weeks you have everything coming into an equilibrium where the temperature will go back to ambient and you have all your your biology you know in a balance uh but at that point the more aging the better because we're trying to get the fungal component up in it mm -hmm. and uh and it's interesting it's, it's what's very interesting is to actually see it under the microscope and know that you're you know what you're doing is is there and we are actually seeing those critters in our soil tests in our soil samples now i can bring a sample down from a field and and we'll see some of them same critters there if they're there naturally or if it's from us putting them in there so yeah so you've, you've kind of seeded the ground with with these organisms mm -hmm. yeah so uh have you considered doing like a Johnson Sioux type method too? Have you experimented with that? Or do you feel like, you know, because you're only turning that thermal pile a few times early on and then it has a long time to age, you're still getting some of those same benefits? You know, we'll we'll probably try a Johnson Sioux for comparison. This is just what we learned right off the bat. And it was the quickest way to get a usable extract. Even though, you know, if it's not as if not as old, you won't have as much fungal component in it. Um, so there, you know, a lot of questions are raised. Can we actually add fungal spore to, you know, compost that is in as old uh, to get a benefit there? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually that kind of goes in. Jeremy's asking a question about, you know, have you done any type of, mycorrhiza fungal inoculation in any of your seed or your soils or are you just a, relying on the natural mycorrhiza in your system and then 
creating the right system for them to grow and expand. Yeah. Um, we haven't added any, we, we, and I have no doubt on it, you know, even if we would, but we haven't added any, um, as a result of this three year study, they did a really deep analysis on the makeup of the biology in there. And <clears throat> we've grown a really good fungal biomass in there. Um, the numbers are starting to look good there, which, you know, that, that those nutrients have to be coming from something. So, you know, obviously we got some, uh, you know, we have a, a, a better fungal bacterial ratio going there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, and you're talking about the, the farms program that you were in because yep. they did yep. a lot of fungal to bacterial testing and ratios there and stuff. So yeah, that'll be good. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's lots of good tests out there for some of these different things. I see that uh, Dr. Laura Cavanaugh is on the webinar and, She's a principal scientist with AEA, and they're going to be coming out with some lower cost DNA testing for soil, which I think will be fascinating to be able to get a cheaper and quicker look at what's in your soil based on DNA. Uh, so there's 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 good things out there. There's better things coming yes. when it comes to being able to test, analyze, and then and then based on that, you need to be able to use that to make decisions on. Do I need more compost? Do I need more extract? I didn't see any mycorrhiza at all. Maybe I need to inoculate. But if you don't measure it, you don't know. Right. And, you know, right now, uh, we're, we're showing really good improvements in our biology. Um, I can't say that I can really see it um, on the side by side that I can see it visually yet. But then my question is, is what, what do we have going there already? you know, as a result of what we've been doing for, you know, quite a few years now. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and typically I think that's true. You know, the biological amendments are going to show the most benefit, the most help on soils that have the least amount of biology in them. Yeah. But somebody, somebody said, you know, uh, when you, when you put some of these biological amendments into a really healthy soil system, it's like turning a bunny rabbit loose in the Amazon jungle. <laughs> yeah. You know, What's the chances of it surviving with all of that other wildlife out there? Yeah, it's probably not very high um, just because there's so much competition and stuff already out there. Um, getting, getting back to the, uh, the nutrient content and the, you know, we talked about low phosphorus in your soil tests, but yet high phosphorus in your, your oats. Willie's asking, you know, when they did that analysis, I assume that was just as traditional chemical soil analysis, may like three extract or something like that. He's asking, have you done a total nutrient digestion type analysis that would tell you how much total phosphorus you have in your soil? Have you done that type of test? No, and that's a really good question. We did not do it on this field. We have done some and they're very interesting. So that is on my bucket list that I need to do the total nutrient on this field that shows that low phosphorus rating to see what is actually there but yeah that's a good point i could add to that in that three-year time period these were all gps coordinate samples colorado state did this um the phosphorus level went from like a 5.3 to 17 on those on the i think it was six coordinates they had looked at and uh even the potassium went up by like 25 percent uh, and this is with basically no added inputs yeah so you, you saw those numbers in Greece even though you, you didn't put any synthetic for yeah. you put some compost extract but that's yeah. Yeah. not have significant amounts of the minerals it's the biology that's stimulating the system to release yeah so Matt is asking, first of all, he says, thank you very much for sharing your operation. You know, that's not everybody's willing to share that level of detail. So we, we do all appreciate that. Uh, his, his question is, you said some of your corn was without seed treatment. So the corn that did have treatment, what kind of treatment was it? And why did you not go with all untreated seed? Was there a reason where, you, you know, were you kind of comparing those? Uh, what was the thinking there? 
you know, the bottom line is I, I want a variety of hybrids and I just could not, it's just hard to get untreated. Um, I had to specifically ask for this one number untreated and that's as much as I wanted to ask for, but we had, um, there was certain numbers I wanted from that I'm used to planting. I just couldn't get them untreated. I really have no fear of going all untreated anymore other than we did see the side by side this year and there was no difference, you know, absolutely side by side with, 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 uh, insecticide, fungicide treated corn and, and none. Mm -hmm. And, and was that a full treatment package with the neonicotinoids and the fungicides and the whole works? I believe so. It was Syngenta and I'd have to look it up. It's what they, it's what they advertise. The base for, package. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. So, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I think that that's what really good farmers in a regenerative system are seeing is that there is no difference, uh, you know, in the performance, but they're, pro you know, long term, there's going to be a negative benefit or a negative uh, effect of having those chemicals in the soil. So, uh, I think that we will see more companies coming out with untreated seed and even there, I think there'll be some pressure on these big companies to offer untreated seed. And and I would encourage everybody to start asking, start asking, because these guys are, you know, they will listen to the customers, but if nobody's asking, if you just sit around the coffee shop or, you know, you know, around the soil health conferences in the wintertime complaining about not being able to find treated seed, but you didn't ask for it. Well, then, the, you know, those big companies aren't getting the message. So more people need to say, hey, I'd like this number, but I'd like to get it untreated. Now, they may tell you no or it's too late or something like that. But then just say, well, keep me in mind, you know, next year, what do I need to do to get this untreated? The more people that say that, the more that's going to get moved up the food chain in these big companies. And, and it will get listened to eventually. Maybe not as quickly as we'd like, but I believe it will get listened to. Um, uh, Dr. Cavanaugh actually posted in the chat here. She said she's excited to bring the new DNA analysis and answer many of the questions we have. We will learn to optimize a microbial ecosystem. The coming years will be exciting. So, yeah, what, once some of that technology hits the market and stuff, uh, Dr. Laura, we may have to have you on, on a webinar as well to, to share some of that exciting information uh, with folks. So that's, that is exciting. Uh, Jeremy's asking, in the three-year study that they did, uh, did they test and tell you what types of fungi were in your soil or were in the soil as far as saprophytic versus, um, you know, the arbuscular mycorrhiza, or was it just general fungal components without any specificity in species? I don't recall there ain't being any specificity. It was uh, pretty much biomass is what it was. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's where some of the DNA testing coming down the road is going to going to help us uh identify that a little bit more right because you know even under the microscope we're hoping we can identify like you know the mycorrhiza uh type but um you know as of now we can just we recognize the healthy looking um fungi but we're not sure what it is <laughs> yeah yeah so just a couple of questions to kind of kind of wrap things up here uh first of all and then maybe we should ask this question to Jolene, although I'm sure she's hiding and doesn't want to come on the screen. But, you know, how much value do you think there was in having her go through the Soil Food Web School? Is that something you'd recommend? Uh, value in owning a microscope so you can be kind of checking and ground truthing the products that you're either making or using? You know, how would how would you tell people that the, where the value is in that type of stuff? You know, the tremendous value in you need to understand what you're doing in the first place here rather than getting something something in a jug and then the power of being app actually able to observe it under a microscope you know is this what what it, you know it says we're supposed to have um things like that um it changes your whole thought process even to the point of now we're like well why should we put fertility down early when we want to challenge the system to work as it was meant to work? Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know can i wait how long can i wait to put any night fertilizer on at all and at that point you know do i add humix to try to lessen the blow of the of the fertilizer with it or will i get to zero it's all questions yeah Maybe talk just a little bit. You, you kind of you kind of broach the subject there just a bit, but why would you put Humix with your UAN fertilizer that you're putting out there? You said it kind of softens the blow. Talk just a little bit about the concepts there. Well, from what I understand, just having that carbon in there as as kind of a recovery food source for the you know for what you've just for the salts that you've just added to the system, you know, which is very anti microbial you know the salt part of the fertilizer um jimmy emmons is the one that sent me on this path he says you really got to consider doing that now and even possibly on on herbicide applications um to soften that blow but it's i mean as i understand it's because of the carbon source you're adding mm -hmm. yeah and, and i think that's that's really important and there's a lot of good information out there uh, that you can find people who are doing some of this type of work, but also the fact that, you know, you're putting 50 pounds or less out there. And that's a big difference between somebody going out there, you know, cause if, if you're, you know, 180 bushel corn, a lot of university recommendations would be, you know, probably what 150 to 180, you know, depending on some yeah. factors there, but it would be three times what you're putting on would probably be the recommendation. And so it's really important that, you know, some of the toxicity is in the dose uh, as well as, as what you're putting out there. So um, all good points there. Uh, Matt is asking the question, you know, I guess this is to us, have we considered carrying non-treated heritage corn seed? Um, we do have some of that type of stuff for specifically for grazing. You know, Jeff showed the picture of the Jimmy Red. You know, we, we've got some things like that. We're not sure that we want to really promote it as a solution to growing grain corn because we know that in some of these heritage or heirloom or open pollinated type varieties, you will give up quite a bit of yield potential versus a hybrid. And so I don't know that you give up as much biomass and, you know, the Jimmy Red, you know, that, you know, that stuff gets 12 feet tall and has a lot of biomass, but it's not going to be a grain yield or like, like a hybrid. So that's, that's part of the difference there. And, and I mentioned this last week, but the, this will be a six week, this is week two, the sixth one that we're going to do uh, is going to be a, uh, a seed corn seed breeder uh, who has a company who is developing uh, all non GMO hybrids and he's developing it, developing these varieties within a regenerative system and offering all of these as non-treated seed. So I think people will be really interested in listening to that. And, and, you know, we have nothing to do with this company. I'm not trying to promote it. I'm promoting the concept that there are people out there who are doing good breeding work in regenerative systems. And it's not just all being done in, you know, high fertility, high tillage, conventional system. There's a lot of it being done that way. Don't get me wrong, but not everybody is going down that road. So we just wanted to highlight some of that good work as well. So our time is coming to an end here, Jeff. Uh, what, maybe just one last thing there, what suggestions would you have for someone who wants to try to take a step into more of a system like what you have, you know, more diversity, uh, more biologically based, lower inputs, uh, you know, what would be one or two tips or pieces of advice you would give to somebody wanting to step into this? So you need to come up with with hopefully something else you can plant besides the corn and beans. And, you know, we can easily overwhelm the oats market. You know, wheat would be a possibility. I've been telling people to consider forage right now. If you could actually just put some forage crop in the system and then be able to come back with with that multi-species, like you said, for for two months. Uh, once you see what that does to your system, you, you know, then you get excited and, and you want to get it into there more. First, I was pushing if you could just, if just 20% of your ground could be something different. Um, we've eventually gone to where we probably well over 30% of our 
farm is something other than corn and beans, but find the crop that you can get in there to extend your rotation. Yeah, I like that. And one thing that you said that I wrote down too that I really liked, um, that that diverse multi-species cover crop, you, you said it has a large tail, which essentially means you see the benefits of that not just this year, but you see it next year and you see it two years down the road. You might even see it three years down the road. Yes. So having that as one year out of three or four in a rotation still makes a tremendous difference. Yeah. I like that. It has a long tail. So, well, thank you so much, Jeff. Great conversation. Great example of how people can do things differently and do it successfully and do it profitably and not have to be trying to farm half the county to do it. So thank you for sharing that, encouraging all of us to do it. This will be posted to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to share this with a friend or a neighbor, please do so. Uh, it will be out on our YouTube channel uh, relatively soon. And we will be back next week, next Wednesday. And I don't even, I should have had the list. I don't even know who we have next, uh, next Wednesday. I forgot to look at my list, but we will be back with another one of our great seed growers uh, sharing some of their system as well. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody for joining yes. and everybody have a great week. Yep. Yep. And Keith, Thanks. I think we've, Keith, we've got uh, uh, Scott Scheimer. Okay, Scott Scheimer from Cheyenne Wells, Colorado. Uh, so going from Northeast Nebraska to Eastern Colorado, we're gonna make a dramatic shift in environments. Uh, uh, so it'll be interesting, uh, some similar principles, but very different practices. So thanks, Jonathan. Hope to see everybody back next week. Thank you.